Oklahoma. Welcome back to TV Teaching for second grade. Today is Thursday, October 8th. Before we get started with our reading and writing today, we're going to take a moment, as always, to check in with our zone and our emotion. When we are better able to name and understand our emotion, it's easier for us to explain them to other people and think of appropriate strategies so that we can get into the green zone ready to learn. So just take a quick moment and check in. Use this chart to help you. And then think of your I message. I feel hmm because hmm. I'm going to show you with Gus. Gus, I feel full of some really positive, but also calming energy because Ms. Wally and Mr. Kevin and I have worked really hard today, and I'm just really proud of the work that we've done. Go ahead, friends, share your iMessage. Okay, before we get started, the materials that you're going to need for today are your learning buddy, and your writing notebook. Now, I borrowed this one from Ms. Gomez because she has it decorated and it looks really cool, but your notebook might look a little bit differently. It's whatever notebook was in your school supplies that you picked up from your school. And then you'll also need a pencil, and later, don't forget, you're also gonna be practicing building your independent reading stamina, so you will need some books for you to read. So. Learning buddy, writing notebook, pencil. Go get those supplies and meet me at the screen. Today for our writer's workshop, I wanna give you some more ideas about what to do and what to include in your writing notebook. So our learning intention today is I am learning how to use a writing notebook and what to include and why we even have a writing notebook. You'll remember we read The Best Story by Eileen Spinelli and it was a story all about a character who was trying to write the best story. And she kept thinking about using in her family for inspiration and they kept telling her what to add. Well, they were giving her advice from their own perspective, their own view of what makes a good story. And you'll remember the character's mother gave her the advice, just include what's in your own heart. So then the character was able to write the best story for her using her own perspectives and her own ideas and what's included in her own heart. Today we're gonna read a story called Nothing Ever Happens on 90th Street. It's by Riney, excuse me, Ronnie Schotter, and illustrated by Kirsten Brooker. And this book is all about a character who has her writing notebook. And she thinks that nothing exciting ever happens on her street, but as the other characters in the story tell her and teach her to look differently at the world, using her senses, using what she sees, what she smells, what she hears, and also viewing the characters, the other characters, as inspiration for things that she can write about, stories that she can tell about things that really are happening on her street. As we read, I want you thinking about your own experiences and think about the people around you and how you can use your small moments and the memories in your life to help you add to your writer's notebook. Nothing ever happens on 90th Street. Eva unwrapped a cinnamon danish, opened her notebook, and stared helplessly at the wide white pages. Write about what you know, her teacher, Mrs. DeMarco, had told her. So Eva sat high on the stoop and looked out over 90th Street, waiting for something to happen. A horn honked, a radio rapped, a kid cried, the usual. Nothing ever happens on 90th Street, Eva scribbled in her notebook. A few doors down, Mr. Chang was arranging fish fillets in his newly opened seafood emporium. No one was buying, and his shop looked as empty and ignored as the tiny boarded up store next to it. He nodded to a woman passing by and called hello to Eva.
Out the door of Eva's building came Mr. Sims, the actor carrying his enormous cat, Olivier. Mr. Sims was on hiatus again, which meant out of work. In between shows, and so every day, dressed in his finest, he embarked on a daily promenade with Olivier under his arm. Writing? He asked. Trying to, Eva answered. But nothing ever happens on 90th Street. You are mistaken, my dear, Mr. Sims said. The whole world's a stage, even 90th Street, and each of us plays a part. Watch the stage, observe the players carefully, and don't neglect the details, he said stroking Olivier. Follow an old actor's advice and you will find you have plenty to write about. Thanks, Eva said. And fast as she could, using as many details as she could recall, Eva described Mr. Sims in her notebook. His felt fedora hat, his curly gray hair, his shiny button shoes. When she looked up, he was halfway down the street and Mr. Morley, the moose maker, was at his window. Now, Eva used what she could see about Mr. Sims to add to her writer's notebook, to give her reader a really good description of what Mr. Sims was like. She said things such as um, his felt fedora hat. She described the material of his hat, his curly brown hair, the text, gray hair, excuse me, the texture and color of his hair, his shiny button shoes. Those details really paint a vivid picture in the reader's mind. Just as he did every day, Mr. Morley set his chocolate pot and coffee urn out on his ledge with a sign. Mr. Morley dreamed of having a catering business where the fanciest people demanded his dessert. But the trouble was, Mr. Morley's moose was missing something. But the trouble, oh, excuse me, now, no matter how he tried, his moose never had much taste. And Mr. Morley never had any customers. Writing? He asked. Um, hmm, Eva answered, chewing on her pencil. Try to find the poetry in your pudding, Mr. Morley said softly. There's always a new way with old words. You're right, Eva said, wishing Mr. Morley would one day find the poetry in his pudding. Taking his advice, she tried to think up a new way to describe the look of Mr. Morley's moose. Smooth and dark as midnight, or maybe more like mink. Yes, that was it, Eva thought, writing in her notebook. Again, she's using the lesson she learned from Mr. Sims and really describing how things look. Smooth and dark as midnight, or like a mink, which is an animal that has a really dark coat. The door to the building slammed and a gust of wind sent dead leaves soaring and dipping like crazy kites. Alexis Leora nodded to Eva and stepped gracefully down the steps to do her warm-up exercises. Alexis was a dancer. When she wanted to, she could hold an extremely long leg straight up against her ear like a one-legged woman with three arms. But she couldn't smile. Eva decided it was because Alexis Leora was lonely. Riding? Alexis Leora asked Eva. Yes, Eva answered. Alexis Leora did six deep knee bends and then sighed. Stretch, she said sadly. Use your imagination. If your story doesn't go the way you want it to, you can always stretch the truth. You can ask, what if, and make up a better story. You're right, Eva said thinking. What if? What if Alexis Leora met someone? Would she smile then? What would that look like? Eva closed her eyes to try to picture it, but all she could picture was soup. Spanish soup, rich and brown and so spicy, it seemed as if she could actually smell it. She could. When Eva opened her eyes, Mrs. Martinez was standing be beside her. She nodded to Alexis Leora as she handed Eva a bowl of soup. Have some. She said, writers need soup. What's your story about? Nothing much, Eva sighed. Nothing ever happens on 90th Street. Add a little action, Mrs. Martinez said, like soup. A little this, a little that, and don't forget the spice. Mix it up, stir it, make something happen, surprise yourself. 
She nodded again to Alexis Lure and went inside. Eva put down her pencil and tasted Mrs. Martinez's wonderful, surprising soup. She thought about her story. It wasn't wonderful. It wasn't surprising. But what could she do? Nothing ever happened on 90th Street. How could she possibly add a little action and make something happen? Eva had no ideas. She was stuck. That happens as writers. Let's continue reading to see how she gets unstuck. Then, Mrs. Friedman from up the block came wheeling baby Joshua in his stroller. He was holding a bright red ball in two tiny fat hands. Bird, he called out to a pigeon hunting for something to eat. Bird, hungry! Pigeon, Mrs. Friedman told him. Eva sighed and looked down at her half-eaten Danish, then her notebook. She looked at baby Joshua, then at the pigeon. She remembered Alexis Leora's words of advice. What if, Eva thought. Suddenly, she had an idea. What if she stood up, broke her Danish into dozens of tiny pieces, and scattered them wide and wild into the street? What would happen? Eva laughed to think of it. From lampposts and ledges, dozens of pigeons swooped down to dine on Danish. Eva eagerly picked, out her, picked up her pencil and began to write again. Bird, baby Joshua called out pointing. More bird, he cried panting. The bright red ball dropped out of his tiny fat hands and bounced onto the sidewalk. Bye bye ball, baby Joshua screamed. The ball rolled off the curb into the street and straight into the path of a pizza delivery man on his bicycle. You see how Eva is taking what she sees as nothing ever happening on 90th Street? And she asks, what if, to add a little spice like Mrs. Martinez invited her to. Everyone gasped in horror. Alexis Leora paused in mid-plie and leaped to the rescue. She got there just as the pizza delivery man landed right side up at her feet. Alexis Leora looked down at the pizza man and he looked up at her. And then something almost unimaginable happened. Alexis Leora smiled. Are you all right? She asked shyly. Her smile was sweet and bright. Her teeth were straight and white. It was the first time Eva or anyone on 90th Street had seen them. Yes, said the pizza man, smiling up at her. It was love at first sight. Pepperoni and peppers rained down on the happy couple. The pizza man pulled a pepper out of his hair as horns began to honk. Eva added this to her notebook and wondered what could possibly happen next. Now, as writers, we can make these small moments and we can ask, what if, to add a little spice, a little action to our stories, to make it more interesting for our readers. Also, Eva's using a lot of really interesting language as she's describing what's happening. She's describing Alexis Leora's smile, sweet and bright. She's describing her teeth as straight and white. So readers, we can really picture the story in our mind. She talks about the, the pizza man with peppers and pepperoni rained down on the happy couple. And the pizza man pulled a pepper out of his hair as horns began to honk. So now she's also including sounds that are happening around her. The sound of the horns honking. A long white limousine was honking its horn loudest of all. She's adding more about the sounds she's hearing. The limo driver rolled down his window. What do you think? What do you want a black block traffic for, he called out. The back door of the limo opened and out stepped a woman in sunglasses wearing a turban and a coat the color of a taxi. There seems to be a problem, Henry, she said in a fake English accent. There's some sort of accident here. Perhaps it's Sandra, someone suddenly screamed, interrupting her. Sandra, can I have your autograph? Mrs. Martinez called out. Sandra Saunderson, Mr. Morley blushed. Was Eva dreaming? There in the middle of 90th Street, larger than life, stood Sandra Saunderson, star of stage, screen, and the sensational soap opera, One World to Live In. Darlings, what's happening here? I'm surely I, Larry, she called out suddenly and stretched her arms toward Mr. Sims, who had just returned from his promenade. 
It's been an age since we saw each other. Mr. Sims' cat, about to be crushed in an extravagant embrace, leaped out of Mr. Sims' arms to chase after baby Joshua's ball. Olivier! Mr. Sims called out. Come back! Everyone raced into the street after the ball, but it was the limo driver who, in the right place at the right time, leaned into the gutter and picked it up. Eva's adding a lot of really figurative language to make this seemingly mundane or boring scene come to life and seem kind of exciting. She's going to go on to talk about um, how the moose, oh, spilling coffee accidentally got spilled into Mr. Morley's moose and how that was just the right ingredient that he needed to change the flavor of the moose to be more like coffee. So now she's including the senses of taste in her writing. And then she goes on to talk about going back to Mr. Chang and his fish shop. And he offered a trout to the cat, Olivier. And Mr. Sims laughs, raw trout, my regrets, Mr. Chang. He won't, he won't eat it. He's a gourmet cat. So talking about how the cat is picky, almost like a human would be. Eva goes on to continue to ask, what if one day Mr. Morley, Mrs. Martinez, and Mr. Chang all combined their cooking efforts to take that empty space next to Mr. Chang's shop and to create a, a restaurant for everyone on 90th Street and how magnificent that would be and how delicious the mousse would be and how delicious the soup would be and how Sandra, Saunderton, Sandra Saunderson would describe that shop as poetry. Now on 90th Street, people who had never spoken to one another before were speaking at last. The pizza delivery man and the limo driver shook hands and everyone tried to tempt Olivier down from his precious perch. And then Mr. Morley appeared on the steps followed by Mrs. Martinez and Mr. Chang. Mrs. Martinez carried a large pot of her surprising soup, while Mr. Mor Morley carried a platter of Mr. Chang's trout, now surrounded by many tiny vegetables and cooked to perfection. With the addition of a cup of Mr. Morley's cat-created mocha mousse, it was a meal worthy of the finest culinary establishment. Do you smell that, Olivier, Mr. Sims called, fanning the steam so it rose up to the ginkgo tree. Now we're including elements of smell into our writing. Olivier took one deep sniff and bolted down the tree to dine. Everyone on 90th, tree, 90th Street sampled each course and everyone on 90th Street sighed with delight. Superb, fantastico, yum! They're all taking part and sharing in this meal. All because Eva thought to ask, what if? Now, as writers, think about what is a writer's notebook? Because your writer's notebook can serve many purposes. It might look like this, where it might list topics that inspire you, move you, make you laugh or wonder. It might help you live a, a writer's life by questioning life, the universe, or anything else. Like questions that you have. Like Eva's question, what if? Your writer's notebook might help you record personal observations, particularly the small details in life, much like we learned from Julie Brinklow in the book Fireflies, where the character was telling the story of a seemingly simple night of going out and catching fireflies and how even the smallest of moments can make us feel the strongest of emotions. You might also include in your writer's notebook meaningful photographs or other artifacts. Maybe you have a receipt from going to a movie and, and that movie was your favorite movie, that that experience meant a lot to you and you keep the, the ticket stub with you in your writer's notebook or photographs of your family or friends to include as writing inspiration. You might also include some creative sketches or illustrations. Draw something from your imagination, much like Eva did, and then go back and add words to it. might help you remember important memories or special moments. This is a fun one. Maybe you have a dream, you wake up in the morning and you think that dream would make a great story. 
write it down in your writer's notebook, daydreams or dreams that you have at night. Having fun, experimenting, and being creative. Remember that there's no wrong thing to do in your writing notebook as long as you're telling your story, telling your truth from your heart and your perspective. This is a chart that is in your ELA pack about what is a writer's notebook. And it goes, it's a list of all the things that I just went over. So you can refer back to this if you have more questions about things that you could add to your writer's notebook. Now your plan, your goal for your independent work is to think about where can you take your writer's notebook? Like Eva took her writer's notebook out onto 90th Street. Is there a place where you could safely take your writer's notebook to write your ideas? What types of entries are you going to put in your notebook? Lists, illustrations, your dreams, photographs? How will you make sure you keep your notebook safe? If you have little kids or animals at home, you need to make sure that your writer's notebook doesn't get damaged by them, even when they're curious and want to see your writing. And what information should you put on the front inside cover in case you ever lose your writer's notebook? So Miss Gomez wrote her name on it, so I know exactly whose notebook that is, and I know exactly who it belongs to. Use these questions to help guide your independent work today to make a plan and begin writing in your writing notebook. You're also going to continue to build your independent reading stamina, reading for longer and longer periods of time to become a stronger and stronger reader. Thank you so much, second graders, for joining me today for our writing lesson. Have a great afternoon. And this is your five minute break where you're going to make sure you go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, and stretch your legs because Mrs. Wally is going to be here in just a moment to do math. Thanks, friends. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.
Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. second graders welcome back from your break before we get started I want to make sure you have the materials you need to do our lesson today so you need to have a whiteboard and a whiteboard marker or a piece of paper and a pencil you need to have counters if you think you might need to use them to help solve problems once we get to that point you need to have your learning buddy and you need to be ready to learn okay so let's shake it off and we're gonna get ready to learn today we're gonna to be solving single step story problems that have to do with subtraction. So why don't you meet me on over at the smart board and let's get started. All right. Here's our warm up question. It says, Luz has 10 stickers. Some are dogs and the rest are cats. How many of each kind of sticker could Luz have? Hmm, go ahead. This is like the problem we started with last time. Let's go ahead and see if you can figure some of the combinations out. I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds and go, and then we'll start writing them out. Go ahead, we'll do some think time, some time for you to work. Luz has 10 stickers, some are dogs, the rest are cats. How many of each kind of sticker could Luz have? Hmm. All right. I'm gonna get my pen ready. Well, you are doing your thinking. All right, so we know that we have 10. And we're trying to figure out parts to make 10. What's one that you know right off the top of your head? How can you make 10? 5 plus 5 equals 10. So we could have 5 cats and 5 dogs. Okay? What's another way we could do it? Hmm. Great thinking. We can toss one over from the cats to the dogs. So it wouldn't be five anymore. It would be four cats. And pretend I had the five stickers and I tossed one over. And now it's not going to be five. It's going to be six dogs. Okay. What else could we do? You could do six cats and four dogs. Yes, you could. Okay, does anyone have another one? Okay, three cats and seven dogs. What would happen if we switched those? Seven cats and three dogs. Now there's more but I'm running out of room, and it didn't say we had to find all of them. Excellent work, second graders. All right, I'm gonna move over to my whiteboard and my pen, and we're gonna work out this story problem together and see if we can get a model, either with counters or a picture, some equations, and find an answer in the label. Are you ready? Okay, so here we go. Oh, get your whiteboard ready. I've got my mark right here. Oh, it's underneath. Hang on, friends. Marker and I need my counters. Let's see, what kind of counters should I use today? How about Legos? Legos are fun to use as a counter. All right, so let's read this problem together. Go ahead and read it out loud with me. There are 15 players on a team. There are seven girls. The rest of the players are boys. How many boys are on the team? Okay, so what's happening here in this story? There's some players on the team and there are boys and girls on this team, okay? And we're trying to figure out how many boys are on the team, all right? So what's the important information we need? Well, we need to know how many players, yep, and do we know that? Mm-hmm, 15, okay. What other information do we have? That there's seven girls. All right, so I want to draw that bar model I was telling you about. And we're not comparing, so we're gonna just draw a bar, we're gonna make two boxes, okay? 
One is going to be labeled G for girls, and one is going to be labeled B for boys. And then the top here is going to be the players, P for players. All right? Go ahead, you put that on your board. Now, we need to figure out where to put all this information. So let's read that problem again. It says there are 15 players on a team. So where would I put the number 15? Does 15 go in the girl part, in the boy part, or the 15 player part? What do you think? Okay, the 15 player part, because it's the players combined, it's the two parts put together, okay. What other piece of information is in this story? Yeah, there's seven girls, so I'm gonna put that with the G or the B. Okay, so we know what? We know the whole and we know the part. When you know a whole and a part, you can subtract to find the other part, or you can count on. Let's do subtraction. 15 minus seven equals blank, or B for boys. Now, look, it's one of those teen numbers. Let's look at the hidden numbers inside seven. Is there a five in seven? Yeah. And what's the other part that would make up that seven? Five and two, okay. So if I have 15 and I take away five, what do I get? I'm at that 10. And now I still need to take away two. What is 10 minus two? Eight. Did I take away seven altogether? I did. So it's 15 minus seven. It's eight. So how many boys are on the team? Now we're not done. We didn't write our answer in a label. Eight boys. Fantastic work, second graders. All right, let's reset. And let's go to the next problem. Oh, look. They drew a picture. Let's practice drawing that picture for that problem. So let's make that rectangle. We didn't draw a picture, we did a bar model. So let's see, you ready? How many players do we need to draw on top? 15, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. I'm gonna make mine a little bit longer. 14, 15. There's my 15 players. There's my 15 players. All right. So now, which part of these players are girls? So they put another bar down here to represent the two different groups. And they use the letter G. So let's do it. How many were girls? Seven. One, two, three, keep going, four, five, six, seven, and that break apart stick. And let's cross it off here so we can figure out this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many are left on the top? One, two, three, count with me, seven, eight. So this is how many boys? And now we know it is eight boys. Okay, let's see what's next. Oh, does that look like what we did earlier? It does. It says you can use words and numbers in a bar model, and that is exactly what we did. Nice job, second graders. Okay, now let's do another one. I'm gonna read it, and then I'm gonna give you a minute to try and solve it on your own. And I want you to either use the picture or the bar model. You use the one that works best for you. If neither of those are working and you need to build it, go ahead and build the parts, okay? Let's read together. 
Jen has 12 pencils. Seven are blue and the rest are white. How many white pencils does she have? Write an equation to solve, show your work. Okay, so you need to do the bar model or the picture and an equation. So what is happening here? Yep, Jen has 12 pencils. And she has two kinds of pencils. Some of them are blue and some of them are white, okay? What are we trying to figure out? Trying to figure out the white ones, yes. So, what's the important information? The 12 pencils is important, isn't it? 12 pencils. What's the other piece of important information? Seven blue. And what about white? Question mark white. Go ahead and solve. I'm going to give you about a one whole minute. It's going to feel like a long time because one minute actually feels really long. I'm going to give you one whole minute to either do the bar model or the picture and see if you can find the answer. Are you ready? And begin. And I'm going to try to stay quiet so you can really think. Go ahead. There's probably some think time music playing. If you just wrote an equation, you need to have a picture or a bar model to match. Strong mathematicians model their thinking to prove their thinking. Okay, if you were to draw a picture, it might look like this. Yeah, and it might, your equation could look a few different ways. It might look like 12 equals seven plus blank, and you figured out it is five. Or it might look like 12 minus seven equals blank, and you figured out that it's five. So that is how you would draw the picture. Now let's look at the number bond. I meant bar model, not number bond. The bar model. We know that together there are 12 pencils. We know that seven are blue, and we were trying to figure out how many were white. So your equation could look one of two ways. 12 equals seven plus blank, or it could be 12 minus seven equals blank. And you might count on to figure that out. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and that's five. Or you might say 12 minus seven, and you take away two and you get to 10. Oh, you can't see my 12. Let me move it over so you can see. Can you see that? Yes, 12 minus seven equals blank. You might say, well, I know that seven is made of two and five. And if I have 12 and I take away two, that's 10. And 10 minus five equals five. Any of those methods are second grade ways to solve this problem. Now our answer would be five white pencils. Don't forget, we have to have an answer and a label. Okay. Let's erase. Okay, next problem. This is our exit ticket. It says, Kendra has 17 stickers. 
She gives some stickers to her friends. Then she has nine stickers left. Which equations could you solve to find how many stickers Kendra has left? Now, friends, most students just start looking at these equations and seeing if they match and just like start, but no, 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 no. We pretend that those equations are not there and we make our bar model. So you're gonna draw with me, are you ready? Draw your bar model. And what's happening here? She has a total of stickers. So up here, we're gonna label stickers. And what does she do with the stickers? She gives some, and she has some left. Let's see what information we know. Do we know how many stickers she has? Take a look. We do, how many stickers? Yep, 17. 17 stickers. Do we know how many stickers she gives? Let's read. She gives some stickers to her friends. <gasps> Do we know how many she gives? Nope. Do we know how many are left? And you know what I'm noticing, friends? I'm reading this and I think they asked the wrong question on here says, which equations could you solve to find how many stickers Kendra has left? Well, we know how many stickers Kendra has left. They told us. So I think that they made an error when they wrote this problem. So we're going to change it to how many stickers Kendra gave. Can you do that for me in your brain? Okay. So we have 17 stickers. We know that there are nine left. Take a look at our bar model. What problems would work? Does 17 equals blank minus nine make sense? Would I take this and subtract this number to get 17? No, so that one's not gonna work. What about blank equals 17 minus nine? Could I take 17 and subtract nine to find the other part? Yes, B is one of the answers. Okay, let's move to the next one. 17 equals nine plus blank. Can I start at nine and count on to find the missing part? Yes, I can. C is another one that we could use. What about D? 17 equals blank plus nine. Can I count on to find the missing add end? Yep. Does it matter which way these go? Nope, we can use it either way. So D works. What about E? E says blank equals 17 plus nine. Can I add these two pieces together to find the missing part? Nope, I can't. So the three equations you could use are B, C and D. All right, second graders, excellent job today doing our subtraction story problems. Meet me on back over at the smart board and take a look. Here's what you're going to do today. You're going to work on page 61 and 62 and it's just what we were just doing. All right, so you're going to work hard on that. If you have problems with that, make sure to circle those problems and when you check in with your teacher, let them know. Make sure you get these workbook pages either to your teacher or send them here to us at the TV classroom so we can see your work. Awesome job, meet me up for our um, affirmation. Here we go. All right, second graders, that was really great work. And sometimes when we're learning new things, it's hard because we feel like we don't understand it but I want you to practice something. It's called the power of yet. Have you ever heard that? And it looks and sounds like this. I don't understand it yet. You might, you might've understood our math today. And you might still be kind of scratching your head going, I don't quite understand that yet, Mrs. Wally. And that's okay because that's part of learning. So your affirmation is I'm going to use the power of yet. So when something feels difficult or confusing, you're gonna say, I don't know that 
yet. That means that you're open and willing to learn it. So here we go. I can use the power of yet. Your turn. Excellent job, second graders. See you tomorrow. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.